and welcome to a very special episode of Sexio Shibugika. I'm Lena, and with me today is the wonderful Tasman. Hi. And we would like to introduce uh, your moderator for the evening, Professor Dr. Bernhard Kiert. He is the director of the Institute of Clinical Anatomy and Cell Analysis in Tübingen. Normally, this program is for students, medical students, and um, doctors, medical professionals to get a little insight into what it's like in the operating room, check out anatomy, and to just get an overall feel of a clinical day. But today we have a very special episode. Tazan, you want to tell us about it? So our topic today is going to be the coronavirus, and we're going to be looking at a patient who comes in diagnosed with COVID-19, so we know he's positive, mm -hmm. and we're going to go from him being, you know, healthy enough but getting progressively worse so we can go through all the different scenarios. Exactly. So we're going to be able to get a nice insight into the clinical side of things. Um, this is the first episode that's going out on YouTube, so it's accessible for everyone without having to sign up to our website, I believe. Yeah. So uh, it's a first time for us as well. We're a little bit excited, but it'll be perfect, I'm sure. Yes, and we're glad you're here. And this is a very interesting side of things to help get some insight into what's actually going on during the yeah. pandemic but behind the scenes and how much goes into um, a um, patient care basically. exactly yeah yeah and for all of you watching you know we're you don't have to be a healthcare professional we we welcome any kind of listeners and we hope you can learn a little bit but let's dive straight into the operating room with uh, Sebastian Streich and our patient is on his way, I believe. I think this evening or today, our operating room is in fact the intensive care ward. So now let's introduce our doctors and nurses. So this is um, Dr. Philip Hen, the senior physician in the intensive care unit at the University Clinic of Tübingen. And as normally uh, would be the procedure, the, uh, the there has been a phone call that the patient is going to be arriving soon so that the intensive unit can prepare themselves um, with all the things that they need for this patient, including um, if he needs any breathing apparatus, mm -hmm. if he exactly. needs any um, intubation, etc. So let's go into our patient. Exactly. So this is the uh, information that the intensive care unit has just received. We have Mr. Jürgen Hemmler. He's 30 years old. 28th of the 10th, he was diagnosed as COVID positive with mild symptoms. So maybe a little fever, some coughs, possibly some slight problems breathing. And a couple of days later, the 31st of the 10th, he has increasing dyspnea that means he he's having real difficulty breathing he's got a still got a fever he's got muscle pains he's being sick he's got diarrhea and the uh, indication was then basically decided that he can go to the uh, medical clinic the infectious diseases ward and then on the 3rd of the 11th his uh, breathing stats basically dropped and now we can have a look at yeah. his... So he was actually at 87% oxygenation at that point, um, which is uh, 6 liters per minute, quite hefty for um, uh, a patient like that. So this is a, an arterial blood gas analysis. You can see the different... Uh, <laughs> the different numbers, basically, uh, at the different times. So it starts at 1 o'clock in the morning and goes all the way down to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Very important, as you can see, the oxygen stats, they start at 99% and then they drop steadily to 92%. Uh, but the oxygen pressure starts at 129 and it finishes up at 60 millimeters uh, Hg, which is very low, too low. Yeah, and very quickly, I just want to point out that this is Professor Dr. Helena Heberle, and she is the head senior physician in the intensive care unit at the University Clinic of Tübingen. So if you just take time to look at the uh, different stats, the different stats, perfect, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. You can see he's going, he's sliding into acidosis, his lactate is high, and then we're going to go straight to the thorax CD. You have the beauty of being able to pause. We don't. 
So here we have um, the CT scan, and we can see a bilateral infiltrate here of his lungs, ground glass opacity. We can see that very well. It's very typical for uh, pneumonia that goes into the interstitium, basically. So it's not just one lobe or one part of the lung, it's both lungs to different uh, amounts, basically. So basically this also means that there are the, the final parts of the lung, the alveoli, aren't able to work properly. So there's too much liquid, they can't kind of like take the air and uh, participate in the blood gas exchange. exchange. Right, so what we're saying is with this inability for the alveolar sacs to fully expand and function the way they should, the oxygenation levels of the blood are just remaining very low and could potentially continue dropping until the patient is no longer able to function. So we have to remember that the lung is a very delicate organ. Mm -hmm. So if we have to intubate with a patient that's this sick, so a patient that's slipping into acute respiratory distress syndrome, we have to be aware of the fact that the high pressure that the breathing apparatus uses could potentially damage the alveoli, these delicate little sacs that do the blood gas exchange. So we have to be aware of that fact and consider when we go through the different stages of treatment that this lung may possibly go into a, a type of fibrosis, so become stiff because the, the elasticity is basically going, it's gone because of the damage that's being done, not just because of the virus or the pneumonia, but also because of the breathing. And that is why it's so important that you have people who know exactly what they're doing when yeah. it comes to the breathing apparatus. <laughs> and you can definitely see when looking at these pictures that there is uh, some serious damage here that needs to be taken care of. And I mean, when you look at that CT and the, the symptoms that the patient was having, we know this is the case. That is important. Yeah. So now we're just going to go back to um, Mr. Streich in the operating room. So, this is again a simulation of what the intensive care unit would be looking at. So, this would be um, the incoming patient arriving in the intensive care unit. Mm -hmm. And again, just to make sure to our viewers know, this is a simulation, this is not an actual patient, and we're just showing you the steps that would be needed in an intensive care unit. So, the first thing you guys can see is basically how many people are involved in the in the transfer of the patient basically you have the, the nurses the nursing team that is bringing him and you have the nursing team and attending a physician who are already there waiting at the bag and what they're doing right now is they're talking to the patient explaining to him what's going on that he's arrived in the intensive care unit and all the steps that will need to be taken to make sure that he's stable once he arrives. So this could be anything from an intubation to um, uh, an ECMO machine to therapy to scans. It just depends on each patient individually. Mm -hmm. So what, what you guys maybe didn't catch was that when the patient was basically delivered, mm -hmm. like, almost say it like that, uh, they did do a quick run through. You know, this is Mr. Hemmel, I believe Hemmel, his name yeah. was, the, the age, the symptoms, just to make absolutely sure that everybody knows what they're doing and as you can see they are attaching all the all the lines the monitoring automatically so this is something that every patient goes through regardless uh, of their uh, symptoms basically so they he's receiving uh, an ECG a continuous ECG monitoring catheter possibly which is coming up soon as you can see he's having a really hard time breathing mm -hmm. currently you can see that he's he's leaning back and using an engaging the auxiliary breathing muscles so yeah. that's something very typical not just patients uh, with pneumonia or, or covid but also asthmatic patients yeah. you see someone leaning on using their upper body to assist their breathing that's someone who's having a lot of issues yeah for those of you watching and listening you can go through your anatomy and figure out which of those <laughs> muscles are really helpful um, if you look down at the bottom right hand part of your screen you'll see his stats right now and the one that we really want to point out is the uh, O2. So our oxygenation is at 86, 87. Um, what does that mean for the patient? Let's talk about that. So 
generally the body you know we want 100 percent oxygen that's what we <laughs> that's what we aim for 99 percent of the time we can tolerate about 95 anything below 95 you want to be keeping a closer eye on your patient anything below 90 the alarm bell should be going off and he should be receiving oxygen very very quickly and just to point out as well the heart frequency is up we're at 114 113 beats per minute that's too high his blood pressure is 190 over 90 also too high so what they're doing now is explaining to him that his stats are so bad that they're going to need to intubate him to, to make sure he gets enough right air basically and what they do is they make sure that the patient is aware of what's going to be happening to him to also keep his blood pressure down keep him in as a relaxed state as he can be in a situation like this and as you can see, the anesthesiologist is talking to him as well. And they're getting everything ready for the intubation. And very important, and this is something that was um, actually not standard mm -hmm. in, in clinics until more recently, not recently, but more recently, is this checklist. So the woman on the left-hand side of the screen yeah. is now going through a checklist. So basically, they have to make sure that anything that goes wrong is prepared for so they're like checking you know is the breathing machine ready and functioning yes do we have a, a heart car outside the door yes is the equipment you know in top form has it been checked do we have all the parts that we need who is doing what so she's going through making sure that everybody knows what job that they're going to be doing in in a few moments does anyone have any questions and we can begin. 100 milligram ketamine and 100 milligram esmerol. Gut, dann würden wir so machen, dass wir die Maske gleich abnehmen und dann die Beatmungsmaske aufsetzen. So he's describing currently um, what the nurse needs to grab to administer to him. Um, and they're also going to be removing his mask, that everyone is aware of that, and starting um, to sedate the patient. Exactly. So they talked about uh, administering drugs like uh, midalazam, ketamine. ketamine. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So now they're changing the oxygen coming from the, the oxygen tank that the patient arrived with to the oxygen from the breathing machine, so which also measures the CO2 output, which is very, very important for uh, the intubation rate to make sure you know you're in the lung and not in the esophagus or not. Okay, now he's telling the patient again what they're going to be doing. This is always important, keeping the patient and all of the medical staff in the room uh, clear on what's going on. 100 milligrams of ketamine. 100 milligrams of ketamine. So they're administering the drugs for the anesthesia now. Patient's still breathing. She confirmed that the um, medication has been administered. And now it's just a waiting game. And the other half of the medication. 100 milligrams is Maron and warten wir jetzt 45 Sekunden, bis die Medikamente alle wirken. And again, a confirmation. And he's saying that we need to wait until the um, medications have taken their effect. So this is pretty standard. Again, what would happen? They're waiting for his breathing to stop, which it has. The nurse is just confirming that his vitals are still stable, and the other attending nurse is preparing everything that's needed for the intubation. They're going to turn off the machine. And they're using a, a video lowering just so which is also very important if, you're, if you could be or are anticipating uh, difficulties during intubation. So you now you have a quick view of what that actually looks like. It's quick. And then they've attached the, the tube back to the, the breathing machine. Turn it back on. They're checking to make sure that everything is functioning before they attach it permanently. Exactly, Ma listening to make sure that it's not in the esophagus. So if, if it were, the breathing machine would cause like a bubbling sound that you'd be able to hear. And it's very important that the, the physician who is then checking that, you know, actually confirms both sides of the lungs are being ventilated. That is very, very important. Yeah. And if you look, our newly ventilated patients, O2 stats have risen again to 95, 96%, and that's already a Massive, massive change from before. If you remember, we were at 86, 87 percent, which in the long term could cause a lot of organ damage.
Yeah. And possibly even some neural damage. Yeah. So especially brain and the kidney being very reliant on good perfusion, high oxygen. Yeah levels what you can also see is that the uh the co2 levels around 37 that's perfect anything the blood pressure is also going yeah. down and they're also attaching this to his face currently they're stabilizing it um, again important so that we don't have any damage to the trachea and inserting a uh, stomach tube and so now they're also going to lay pico artery. So they want to prepare the femoral artery now. And as you can see in the back, we have the other medical staff getting ready. So just to uh, explain quickly what a, a, a PICO uh, artery basically is, for those of you who don't know, uh, PICO is an acronym which stands for Pulse Contour Cardiac Output. So you're able to see uh, basically how much blood the, 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 the heart is pumping and the contour gives you a lot of information about um, so we also have a chat function and right now um, the question is why did they decide to directly intubate him instead of using other methods first? And um, Dr. Heberle is mentioning that his stats were so bad that this was one of the only options that they had. So again, she's pointing out the fact that this is a patient who's suffering from ARDS, so acute respiratory distress syndrome. He really, really had a lot of trouble uh, breathing, and the breathing is was the primary issue. Now that he's been properly intubated, we can move on looking to treat uh, while assisting his breathing. And one of the things that we want to keep an eye out for is, as, as I mentioned beforehand, is the cardiac output. And that's how this PICO artery arterial line helps with a... Well, we'll get to that in a minute, I think. There's like a, a mister at the end, and they measure how uh, quickly the temperature of the blood changes when they infundate. Uh, yeah. yeah. And um, you don't always have this intensive um, method of intubation, but for a patient that is this far along in his uh, uh, COVID um, respiratory issues, this is really the best and only uh, thing that could be done mm -hmm. yeah. for him currently. And we know how uh, how quickly uh, patients with ARDS uh, can kind of decompensate. So at the moment, he, he maybe he might have been okay, he might have been awake, but he was very tacky uh, cardiac. He had tacky, uh, <laughs> his breathing was very, very fast, the fever. And you never know how quickly this decompensation to take place. And it hits the heart first. So the lung isn't being... Uh, uh, it can't uh, get enough blood, and that in turn causes a higher uh, pressure on the right ventricle. Yeah. So it's right heart failure that we need to be careful and uh, looking out for at this moment. And um, that's why right now we're going to be looking at the right-hand side of the screen. Um, they're using sonography right here to do a puncture. Uh, ein zentraler Venenkatheter gelegt. Ja, ja. And so we can actually watch right now a central catheter being um, put in. So just to just quickly explain, we're not doing this to our actor. Yes. <laughs> These are uh, videos that were taken uh, in the clinic. Exactly, at bedside. We're going to aspirate this currently mm -hmm. to, to make sure that everything has been uh, you, you put don't in want the <laughs> So it's, it's one of the typical things you do just to make sure you're not in the artery. If you were, there would be a lot uh, more blood. It would be lighter. It would be pulsating out. Pulsating, yeah. So, and that's, I believe, what Professor here is now just pointing out as well, that this isn't a real patient. We're not... Uh, 
torturing people, correct, in the name of science, yeah. And as you can see right there, that dot in the middle would be the, um, would be this, would be the metal insert of the that you see exactly. here. Yeah. So I believe all these videos that were filmed at the patient's bedside or at different patients' bedside uh, are also available. Yes, and down at the bottom exactly. you can see where you can re-view these videos. Eine Dialyse ansetzen muss. Wir hatten ja vorher gesehen, das Kreatinin war erhöht. And the other thing that they're saying is that they're, they're, they're putting in central lines because, mm -hmm. again, this is a patient who could really, really go downhill fast. This would be a prime patient who would be suddenly on dialysis after being quite healthy. Exactly. Not just dialysis, we're also thinking about the heart. We might have to think about an ECMO or an extracorporeal uh, membrane oxygenation. <laughs> we got there in the end, exactly. So these are all things when when dealing with intensive care patients that you have to have already in the back of your head, like what I'm anticipating, they're anticipating the next thing that could go wrong. Of course, in any case, you hope that it doesn't go wrong. Right. Um, so she's pointing out exactly the same thing Tasman just said. <laughs> um, it's just a precautionary measure to where you can very quickly administer the um, medications that you need to the patient in a very direct way. Exactly, because this goes straight to the heart, <laughs> to the heart which is what you want in, in a patient like this. Yeah. This is the subclavia. So there are different places that you can put central lines. Subclavian, uh, exactly. Right. The subclavian, is, I believe, is difficult, more difficult. You could also just do the, the jugular, as, as in this case. But you have to be uh, aware of when you start putting in the, uh, the tubing, is that you're so close to the heart, again, so you can irritate. And that's why usually you have an ECG running. You, ir you can irritate the right mm -hmm. heart, the right yeah. atrium. Yeah. Worst case, the right ventricle yeah. and cause um, uh, arrhythmia. Yeah. And here again, they're just fixating everything, make sure there's no. Also, intubation, we've just seen central venous catheter, and we have. So, and this is everything that happens. Again, he, Professor here is pointing out to uh, uh, you guys that this happens when someone comes into intensive care. This isn't just, especially because this is a corona patient. This is someone. Yeah, this could be any patient on the intensive care ward. So they arrive, if, they're in, if they need to be intubated, they're intubated, they get a central line, they get a pico artery that we're going to... Uh, well, yeah, exactly. They're now saying that you infundate uh, natsal, which is natrium chloride, and then you measure how quickly the uh, blood warms up again, basically. Right, so essentially this cold transfusion is given and we want to see how long it takes to warm up through its movement through the body. And then you can, um, you can essentially see the arterial uh, pressure mm -hmm, that you need to decide how much uh, medication and in what flow. Mm -hmm. How much liquid does the patient need? Yeah. Liquid is the too much liquid. That's something mm -hmm. else that can happen with heart failure, that the heart cannot deal with, with the amount of liquid or blood that's there. So you have to then make sure you're taking out so the, uh, there's more coming out than going in, basically. Right. So now we just jumped to a um, ephemeral catheter. And sonography again to see what's going on, to watch for the um, pulsating, um, the arterial, femoral artery. In das in die Arteria femoralis, über die man periphery entry ablesen kann. Ja, so dynamisch ja. hat man ein Monitoring, ein sehr effizientes Monitoring. So she's she again. This is this is still the the pico being inserted. It's going into the the femoral artery. You can see so much. So that's you could see what how how the temperature changed when the Nazel was introduced to the body system. And they, you do it three times, and then you work out the uh, cardiac output. And now we're back to <laughs> Mr. Strike. <laughs> 
Und ähm, bevor der Patient jetzt... So, right. we just saw the central line and the pico. <lacht> and now we're going to see what happens. Next, um, on an anatomical level. Exactly. So we're going to... <lacht> we're going to go back up into the studio with Professor Dr. Hjot. And this is from the um, Atlas of Anatomy of the Human Body. Mm -hmm. By Springer. Yes, I believe, yeah. And so this is a really great view from the topography of this area, where we, again, we're talking about the femoral artery um, and laying that catheter. So, we have the groin area with... <laughs> yeah. With the artery and, and the vein. So something that every medical student learns in like the first semester, the second semester, is something that's called Ivan. So it helps you memorize uh, which artery and vein is where in the uh, groin. So it, in German, it's quite easy. They say in inside vein and then outside. Just imagine outside with an A, outside artery. Exactly. And then even more outside of that is then the nerve. Uh, uh, so just have a good look at this picture. This is this is what not only medical students have to learn, but also um, nursing students, for example, and other uh, healthcare professionals. So he's pointing out the um, the importance of seeing how close the vein and the artery are to one another, um, and that it's really important, especially with this kind of catheterization, to be aware of that. And again, how to memorize it, which um, Tasman just so, viel mal so wonderfully <laughs> described. <laughs> so that's just a little X course for you. Uh, I think we're going to look back into the <laughs> intensive care unit to see what's going on to our, with our patient. So we're back down in the intensive care unit. And we're going to see what's going on with our patient as far as turning him um, as a form of therapy and why that's important. So a lot of you will have seen the pictures from around the world about how corona patients are uh, intubated and then the, the breathing is then done when they're on their stomach, so in a prone position. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's done for 16 or 18 hours a day, and then they turn them back, which we'll see shortly. Exactly. So this is something that uh, isn't done with, with all intubated patients, but it's something that, that we've discovered that really works uh, especially well. So it reduces the risk of uh, long-term uh, long lung damage, uh, which is why we do it. So you can see again how many people are involved with turning him. So if you want to see, they're also bolstering um, his shoulder area and his hip area to make sure that they can smoothly turn him over and also so that he has um, a little bit more cushion and height uh, to help his breathing. Something a lot of people don't think of, and I certainly didn't when I started out, was when someone is, is prone or can't move on their uh, own, is that you have areas of your body that, that are actually, they have a lot of pressure being put on it. So it's just your own body weight, but it can cause quite serious damage. So um, decubitus is a real, real problem, especially in the intensive care units where patients uh, like our patient here um, could potentially suffer, which is why it's so important that, you know, the nursing team, everyone has an eye and make sure that, you know, the elbows aren't, don't have a lot of amount of pressure on knees, forehead, hips. And as you can tell, each person again has their role to play. They're looking at especially the shoulders um, to make sure that there's no tension on them. And the doctor stays with the head uh, the entire time, which is what um, is being discussed currently, um, that they need to make sure all of the central lines, the intubation, 
um, are all in one place because if there was an issue with the intubation coming free, for example, then the patient would have a matter of seconds, if not so minutes, if not seconds, um, for them to turn the patient back over and put in the um, intubation tube again. So that's something where the doctor needs to be um, at the head of the patient the entire time. So if you think back to the CT, the dorsal area was the area where there was most uh, uh, of this ground glass opacity, most secretions. So by turning the patient on his stomach, we're allowing uh, the secretions to basically gently move out of that area, which of course is beneficial in the long run as well. So um, there are a couple of questions from the chat that we had when we uh, were displaying this live. And the question is, does it actually make sense to have the patient on its, his or her stomach, yeah. which we already talked about um, as far as the prone position is concerned. Um, but like Tasman said, um, it's about 16 hours that the patient is on his stomach, and then he's turn, he or she is turned back um, onto their back. This is something that the rotation really helps with the breathing and the mobility of the patient at the end of the therapy as well. So we have to remember that breathing is like really important. <laughs> I mean, we don't have to discuss the fact that, that it's important, but we have another eight hours in the day where the patient needs to be washed. He, he, he needs to have his uh, mucous membranes uh, moistened. He needs to, you know, use the toilet, have uh, lines cleaned uh, and changed. So they're saying that in these eight hours, they usually also do an x-ray just to make sure that they know exactly what's going on. Yeah. So now we're talking about COPD. Uh, no, not COPD, sorry. We're talking about chronic re uh, acute respiratory <laughs> distress syndrome. Excuse me, I got a little um, distracted. So they're saying that it's very it's an ARDS patient that is how they usually arrive. They arrive with their oxygen at, uh, oxygen sat slipping. They have trouble breathing, and then they can they really decompensate very 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 fast, and they need to be intubated. And now we're just looking at the different uh, diagnostic and therapeutic uh, things that we do basically. Right. So the difference also between someone who has has respiratory distress syndrome and someone who is possibly just having mild breathing issues because as you can see from this chart there's a lot of um, extra steps that go into treating mm -hmm. a, a patient with acute respiratory distress syndrome. So what they look at in, at the moment with COVID being so rampant is they do a, a, a COVID PCR test, they check the temperature, the breathing frequency, the uh, oxygen saturation, then uh, they do a, a lung x-ray and then they do a routine lab, including IL uh, interleukin 1 and 6, a differential uh, blood workup, and then a CT, and then they, they look at two wells. And then according to that, they then decide if it's an ARDS, which means they need immediate care, immediate intensive care, or if it's someone who can go to a normal ward and be treated, for example, with uh, anti or viral drugs. Yeah. What she's also talking about is the first 10 days especially if the patient doesn't have uh, very severe symptoms, is using ribdesmavir, and then after 10 days switching to dexamethasone. But neither of these help with the exchange of gas within the body, and that's why they also suggest ECMO as a therapy. Um, and also important in this would be anticoagulation drugs, um, which down at the bottom you can see the four uh, uh, different, or three, I'm sorry, different um, choices that we have that we've seen positive results from specifically for COVID-19. So what uh, very, you know, some virus can cause or other other uh, illnesses can cause as well something called DIC which, mm -hmm. which means a disseminated intravasal coagulation yes. basically your body kind of overreacts it gets really excited and then it starts um, producing different factors that can cause thrombosis that can cause embolisms and this is something that they really 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 
uh, have an eye on. That's why it's so important that the anticoagulation is, is started quickly mm -hmm. and is kept up for a long uh, amount of time. So there's three different things that they do. It's like direct uh, thrombin inhibitors, like uh, Argat-Schaban. It's funny saying it with an English, <laughs> in English and not in German. Okay. And now we're going to jump back to dexamethasone. So we're saying up until day one, they will give dexamethasone. Is that a wichtige medication? Anhand von den Studien, die wir vorliegen, so he's asking if it's an important uh, medication, and based on these studies that are available currently, um, it inhibits a cytokine storm, which causes the this DIC, this coagulation inside the the small or, or larger blood vessels, even. Elimination von Viren nicht beeinträchtigt. And it assists basically in the elimination of um, the virus. Um, and there's all kinds of different uh, studies at the moment. Six milligrams seems to be what the studies are saying at the moment is the most effective with coronavirus. I heard that etwas passiert gerade. Okay, so as you can hear, something is happening in our um, intensive care unit. So we're going to have a look at his stats. So he's back to having a really bad oxygen saturation with 67, so that is a lot worse than it was. And so the question is, he's intubated, why is this still happening? And that's what we're going to talk about in this next section. So we have decided because right now there is no um, oxygen uh, exchange <laughs> correctly taking place. So there is oxygen being put in, but there is no exchange happening. It's not getting to the blood. And um, we're that, gonna, that means we want to look at the heart. It's the heart that is uh, now in trouble. And that is why we're talking about inserting or using an ECMO. So this is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. <laughs> Pardon me. So on the right side of the board there, you can see a simplified uh, drawing of the heart. And on the left then, you can see a very simplified ECMO. So we're talking about why we need something like this. Um, this is one of the older versions that we have. And what you can see on the inside are two different membranes. Yeah, and we can definitely see uh, where the um, where the blood would go in and out, and it's right here in this tube. The blood would flow in. This is the deoxygenated blood, and you can see how the blood would um, spread itself out in this first membrane which is basically what happens in the lung as well. And then it would move on to the light membrane, and this is where the oxygen would be um, administered, and the blood would then, of course, take up the oxygen and then leave the second tube and enter the patient's body again. The important thing is to make sure it's functioning properly, we have to have a very high amount of blood flow. So this is basically assisting the lungs, assisting the heart. So you have to, you have, to have enough blood basically that goes through to kind of make it work like the, the, the heart and lungs. So how does this work on a schematic level? He's going to show us very quickly. This is again Dr. Hen. We have the subclavia, the jugular, the superior uh, vena cava, the right atrium, the right ventricle, and the inferior vena cava. Sorry. Sorry. So normally the deoxygenated blood will come from the upper and lower um, body, uh, go into the right atrium, into the right ventricle, and then into the, the truncus pulmonalis, into the lungs, into the pulmonary trunk. And then from there on into the lungs. So one of our entry points will be down in the um, groin. Das ist eine lange, lange, lange Kanüle und die wird von der Leiste unter Ultraschall kontrolliert. 
Kontrolle. Also so this is a very long cannula that's inserted into the femoral artery again. Hier mit der Spitze direkt am Übergang von der cava inferior. And it, it lies basically right into the, almost right into the right atrium. Hat viele kleine Löcher an der Spitze und an der Seite. He keeps saying he's going to show us in a minute. It's very. Das schlecht. And he's saying there's holes in the side because that is how you can get the most blood out. Yeah. So it kind of suctions the blood out of the right atrium, out of the, the inferior vena cava, and then out as we uh, This goes out to the ECMO machine, and this attaches to a pump. As you can see here, this is a great drawing. We can actually visualize what's going on. And it goes through this pump and then again into the membrane. Remember, there were two membranes, one to draw the carbon dioxide out and one to add the oxygen back to the blood, which was missing before. Now, what happens to this blood? Let's find out. It's going to be attached to a second cannula into the jugular interna, so the internal jugular vein. And he's saying you can already see the difference. So you could, you can see that the blood is now much lighter. It looks like arterial blood as compared to the blood that's going into the, the ECMO, basically. Okay. Und von da fließt es dann hier in den rechten Ventrikel und that's then basically put right, right back into the, the right atrium, into the ventricle, and continues the blood cycle. Okay. So there's a lot of um, oxygenated blood coming through this machine. Um, but what is the reason why our um, oxygenation levels might not just jump up automatically? And, um, what he's saying is that there's also deoxygenated blood that's left in the body still coming and mixing with this new oxygenated blood. Um, you also have a recirculation of this um, arterial blood back into the ECMO machine. So it takes a while to yeah. level out and bring up the oxygen levels. So at first you might not see a big jump like we did when we uh, first intubated the patient. And in some in some cases it never jumps up as well. But it's again it's not it's not something that's meant to last. So it's to stop hypoxia, so acute hypoxia. We can maybe make it jump 20 oxygen saturation points. Maybe we won't be able to get up to 90. Of course, you know, in the best case scenario, it will go up to 100 and we'll all we'll be very happy. But this is something that's, it's just the reality of, of using an ECMO, is that it, it can, it can work better or worse, basically. Yeah. And now if you remind, uh, if you remember back on our previous scenes where we had the, um, the femoral line, it was a very thin cannula. And as you can see here, the size of it has um, increased quite a bit. And this is important because, again, we need that large volume of blood flow to go through this machine and back into the body. And here's the pump, the centrifugal mm -hmm. pump that we have. And again, it's getting put into the oxygenator. The green part is where the oxygen would be attached, and fittingly, the pumps, uh, the cannulas are colored with a blue and a red, so that way you know, do I have material <laughs> blood or do I have renal blood here? Exactly. And again, this is done with an, uh, ultrasound. an ultrasound. So the, the thing that he's showing now is called a dilator. So you make a little cut and then you put in different sized plastic tubing basically to, to make sure expand, it expand yeah, exactly. the vessels because you don't want to damage the vessels throughout this as well. Or more, at least more than you have to anyway. Right. Die Grundtheorie der ECMO Therapie. And that's principally uh, what goes into an ECMO machine. Okay. Wir starten mit der ECMO Therapie. Hier kann man noch mal We've decided at this point because of the oxygen saturation decreasing again even with the um 
intubation that we need to go into the ECMO machine. ECMO machine. This is actually the only option for him currently. So we're going to go back to the studio um, before we go back to the intensive care unit um, simulation. So Professor here is just saying thank you for doing such a, such a brilliant job of explaining. I hope Lena and I could do justice to what he was saying. So uh, an important question is, of course, what is the long term outlook of a patient on an ECMO machine. Right. So, um, we do have some patients that need to be on the ECMO machine for more days or even more weeks. It really depends on how the patient's doing and each individual patient's stats. Um, is there a maximum amount of time? And Frau Hebele, Dr. Hebele is mentioning that there isn't a maximum amount of time that you can be on a machine. So 100 days would be out of the question, she's saying. You'd have to you know, start thinking about other solutions, lung transplant, heart transplant. So um, to get them off the ECMO machine, we slowly start to mobilize the patient, and um, we start moving them around. And the end goal is, of course, to have them breathing on their own again. So we'll slowly start weaning them off of the ECMO machine. But they're saying, she's saying that they can extubate the patients and then they can still move around with the ECMO. Yeah. Yeah. You, of course, want to look at the lung function uh, before you decide if you want to take them off the machine. Um, there's also another question <laughs> from the chat. We have a system in the venous system. Und immer wenn ich jetzt mit einem großen äh, Katheter da reingehe, wo dann auch noch etwas mit Luft irgendwie geschieht, hätte ich Angst, dass eine Luftembolie entsteht, dass also Luft angesaugt wird. So the question is basically, <laughs> uh, how likely is it that you could have an air embolism because of the low pressure system and the big tubing and stuff like that? So and the answer is, well, they try very hard not to let air get in the system. Right. It, it, they, that is the most important thing. They know how to attach the um, the different cannulas. They know how to uh, correctly uh, find the veins and arteries that they need. And um, what we'll see is down in the intensive care unit simulation, we'll have a pretty good understanding of, of how, they how do this it. happens yeah. and how the prevention is really um, seen. In just something else that she mentioned earlier is the fact that the uh, longer someone is on an ECMO or intubated, the higher the risk of complications, of course, as well. So now let's have a look and see how it works. Yeah. And again, this is going to give you a better understanding of um, how we prevent the embolisms, how the ECMO machine is attached. And um, we're mentioning one more time that this is a simulation. We cannot put this into our actor. <laughs> so we're going from the standpoint of the um, cannulas have already been inserted. Um, uh, cranially and uh, caudally, so we can see the attachment of the hoses, uh, not the cannulas. And so we have a transesophageal echocardiogram here. You know, Mrs. Heberle is going to tell us what we can see exactly. So, we can see the tachycardia. We can see the left and right ventricle. Mm -hmm. The so left ventricle is the one she's just going to show us just now. It's the one with uh, more muscle. More muscle. Muscle. <laughs> 
There you go. That's the left ventricle, which is which is functioning quite well. And this is the right ventricle that she's indicating now, and that's it's too large. It's usually much smaller. So we now know uh, that the the right heart is under pressure. We can see the septum of the heart um, moving more towards the left heart than it should. So there's a lot of stress being put onto the right side of his heart. So in the next, there we go, in the next scene here, we can see how um, this, this metal here from the insertion uh, is seen. Draht is. Wenn man dann die nächste, es kommt glaube ich noch mal eine, oder? Let's see where it is. Yeah. So again, they do this using ultrasound because it's it's so, so important to know exactly where you are. You don't want to damage or stress the heart more than necessary. And then you can see the cannula. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Jetzt heißt es oben T E E. And this is from the vena cava inferior T E. Transesophageal echocardiography. Das unterscheidet sich von der transtorakal. So they're just just saying again T E E transesophageal. Esophageal echocardiography. Instead of a mouthful. Wir schalten noch mal nach unten auf die Intensivstation. Compared, of course, the T T E, which is a transthoracic. So. We have the team, both of the cannulas have been placed, and we can see the picture, we know that it's in the correct area. And so now we're going to add the um, elongation for the cannula from the patient to the machine. And so we're going to start actually in the groin area. Um, good. Oh, sorry. <laughs> he just said. <laughs> All right, so we're starting on the jugular. Excuse me. Um, and this is basically how they get rid of the air. It's so simple. It's what, the same thing you do with normal lines as well. You just tap it, give it a little tap, make sure the. The air bubbles rise. And this is again to uh, answer that question that came into the chat mm -hmm. earlier about embolisms. So we're going to put a little more of the saline solution in. Passt soweit. Jetzt würde ich hier oben dann abklemmen. Okay. So they clamp it in the liquid to make sure that there is absolutely no air in that part of the system. And he said it's uh, these um, tubes end almost at the same length. Die Klemmen nicht so gut halten. Okay. Jetzt der Herr Löschmann, der Christoph, würde uns jetzt hier anreichen. Das System ist steril eingepackt. Dann hier zunächst mal zwei so Plastik. So the system is actually sterilely packed and comes with plastic clamps. And within the set, there's also marked tubes which um, show where the clamps need to be attached before you start um, putting them onto the um, other attachments that are already on the patient, the cannular attachments. And you can also see what a great job they've done marking this for us with red and blue so we can very, uh, very clearly make sure that the patient um, is attached to the ECMO machine correctly. It leaves less room for error, basically, if you if it's basically foolproof, blue to blue, red to red. You know exactly what's going where. The red being the arterial, blue being the venous. Wieder zurück zum Patienten. Jetzt haben wir hier oben noch die Knüppel drauf und die kannst du jetzt mal durchschneiden, Sabine. Okay, so they're just going to cut off the little caps at the top. And you have to do this for both of the tubes. Okay. Und jetzt kommt der spannende Moment. Wir müssen das jetzt sozusagen ja luftleer anschließen. And now the moment of truth. <laughs> das heißt, es kommt. They need to attach the tubes to the cannulas. By taking off the blue cap, they can now insert the one tube into the other, but first they need to 
fill with uh, saline solution and the entire time that they're putting it together there has to be a stream of liquid going over the two ends so what they mentioned earlier is a, so little tiny the occasional tiny bubble of air isn't isn't the you know the the, the big problem it's yeah. if it's a lot of air and of course you want the minimum amount but just people that are watching thinking well that's not airtight. No, so we can check back and have another look at his stats. So he's still tachycardic. He's still got a very, very low ox blood oxygen level. And his blood pressure is still uh, low. Yeah. But he's stable. And that is the most important thing. Right. So um, he's saying that he's ready to start. And the... Um, the technician is also, again, going through a checklist to make sure everyone is on the same page, they know what they're doing, they checked the lines first, then they were instructed to remove the clamps, which they did. And then we can see the uh, venous blood leaving the patient, going into the uh, machine, the ECMO machine. Now we can have a look at the patient's stats again. The oxygen levels are rising, which now, is wonderful. Of course, what we want to point out here is they started rising before the blood was <laughs> yeah. reintroduced to the patient. That is not what happens. That was just because of our simulation. Um, normally, the oxygenation will first rise once the blood has entered the patient again. So uh, Dr. Hebeler is just mentioning, re-mentioning what we talked about earlier, saying that an ECMO, it, it does not always do this. It, this is like the perfect outcome. The blood oxygen level shoots up to 100, pulse stabilizes around 80. You know, we've even got um, blood pressure rising to a more healthy level. Yeah. It's, it's good. It means that the, the pressure has been taken off the heart, the, the lung has more uh, time, opportunity to heal without having to um, have the stress of the exactly. um, oxygenation, or the process of oxygenation with the damaged avioles. So again, she's saying the next step could uh, theoretically be extubating the, the patient. Yeah. Das Which means, again, they can do uh, physiotherapy from, from day one as soon as they're able to and practice breathing techniques, which you're going to be looking at, I believe, in a minute. Mm -hmm. And now back to the studio. And so you essentially have this, um, this artificial lung with you, if you think about it. And um, Dr. Hirt is wondering how it looks even to have a patient moving around with that. Um, so this is essentially an x-ray of the thorax after an ECMO has been placed. And again, we can say this will not heal the, the lung. This is nothing to, you know, not a magic wand that you can just wave and the lung will be healthy. You can still see uh, the damage that's done. So uh, the lung usually will be black indicating a lot of air and there's a lot of liquid in the in the thorax cavity right now so she's just indicating the cactus the tube the breathing tube this is ganz wichtig for the lagerungs and the, the bilateral exactly the lunge oben haben die schlechter erkrankt ist wenn so this is helping the heart and reducing the risk of uh, long-term heart damage, as we mentioned. Yeah. Was ich sehr spannend finde, ist, wir sehen und erleben, äh, wie wichtig es ist zu lernen. Wir haben eine neue ja. Erkrankung und ganz offensichtlich greifen Medikamente, von denen man gar nicht so, davon um, ist, dass sie What Dr. Hirt is mentioning von, uh, is how little we knew at the beginning of this pandemic and how far we've come in treating patients with this, specifically knowing about um, anticoagulation, knowing how ECMO can help, knowing about uh, intubation, and that's not the only option. So here we're going to go back to the patient and what's happening as far as mobilizing the patient. Um, it looks as if our patient has been extubated, which is really great for our patient. It means we can 
edge him towards getting out of the intensive care unit and towards a recovery. So this is our cardiac technician, Mr. Löschmann. He's just uh, talking again about the the, um, the tubing, basically how important that everything is kept sterile, that there is no air in the system, and and this is this is what this machine looks like. So this is an ECMO machine, yeah. and it's not just this top part. There's a lot of other um, little sections of this machine that are just as important as this middle section um, that's helping with the pump. Um, and it's attached to what's called a sprinter. So basically, it's some, it is something with wheels. The patient can move around with it. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is built to be used with, to someone, you know, with someone that can be mobile. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. So that's the gas blender. And it, it basically means you can adjust, it's a flow meter and you can adjust how much oxygen uh, goes in, yeah. And this is important when weaning off the patient or weaning the patient off of this. Um, and we could have up to 100% oxygen um, that can be given to the patient. If you want to reduce the amount of oxygen, you can just turn this little knob on the side that he's mentioning. And this is how much oxygen is being put into the blood and how fast it's being perfused. And once again, he's mentioning how important this is to wean the patient off um, to be able to um, change the amount of oxygen that's being given to the patient. They can turn it completely off or very low and see how the patient reacts. And if the patient's lungs are not ready to do this on their own to keep the um, O2 stats up, they can then uh, turn it back up. And once the patient responds positively, they know that they're ready to remove the ECMO machine from the patient. So they actually do have the ability to remove the um, carbon dioxide mm -hmm. from the blood. And it's quite a simple uh, thing, really. It's not it's not overly complicated. It's basically just diffusion. So uh, gases or other uh, liquids, you know, a lot of different things move from the area of high concentration to low concentration. So the blood that arrives in the ECMO kind of arrives with a lot of carbon dioxide and it hits area, you know, with low carbon dioxide. So basically, it, it just gets washed out. That first membrane is where yeah. this occurs. And as the blood perfuses into the second membrane, again, you have the oxygen uh, the oxygen there mm -hmm. that's just getting taken up. And um, there's a lot of different um, uh, specialties that go into taking care of a patient like this. Da ist auch nochmal wichtig, da ist auch interprofessionelle Zusammenarbeit wichtig, hier yeah. Pflege und Physiotherapie natürlich. Die Pflege ist ja auch mit dem Boot, muss ja auch... So, um, once you're able to mobilize the patient, it's again important to keep the um, medical staff, or including nurses, assistants, doctors, physiotherapists, the anesthesiologists, everyone needs to be involved in this um, uh, in this scenario to make sure that the patient can quickly and, and safely, safely yeah. start being mobilized. Um, so we have two new um, people in our intensive care unit mm -hmm. on the left-hand side, and they're wearing uh, green t-shirts, if you can tell, mm -hmm. uh, but they're the two people on the left who are physiotherapists right now. Mm -hmm. The first one has already told the patient who he is, what he's doing, mm -hmm. and they're starting to slowly get the patient in a position to where they can begin moving him, which won't be all at once on the first day, but we're going to show you uh, fairly quickly the steps that would gradually yeah. um, be present in an intensive care patient with an ECMO machine. So something that's really important for patients being mobilized after intensive care is to like set a goal for each day and then to also reflect on that quite often and just to remind him like yesterday you couldn't sit up in bed on your own, today you can. But these, these, this is a young guy who hasn't moved perhaps for two, three or four days. So again, this mobilization is very important, and we don't want the uh, muscles to atrophy, but he has been laying 
down for a while, so he needs a lot of assistance. And um, important to mention is, because of his low lung function, the high stress on his heart, even sitting up is something that takes a lot of energy and might not be something that the patient can do on his own. So just just consider again the amount of people that are needed. So this is again a three-person job. We have a nurse, an intensive care nurse, ready at the back, making sure that none of these this, these lines, the tubing, the ECG monitor, the ECMO, none of this gets dislodged. Yep. And something that was pointed out is that the physiotherapist or the nurse, one of them must have their hands on um, the tubing for the ECMO machine at all times. Um, previously, so maybe 15 seconds ago, the woman on the right had her hand on the tubes and she needed to move her hand at which point the man on the left took over holding the tubes. Mm -hmm. And this is something that is um, standard, that nothing is um, is left to um, be pulled out or stop working or get stuck somewhere. Just as important as stabilizing the tubes, as you can see here, <laughs> stabilizing, stabilizing the patient. patient yeah. Right, so yeah. you have this very close relationship between the physiotherapist and the patient. She's stabilizing him with her feet on his feet, her knees on his knees, so mm -hmm. that there's no chance of him slipping and falling if, or if he collapses. Exactly. There can be no serious harm done. Exactly. So there's always someone with the patient making sure that nothing serious can happen. So uh, Professor Hitt was just pointing out again how uh, life-saving ECMO therapy can really be because this patient would not be alive without it. Yeah. He, he is able to, to breathe on his own. We, we can see him moving. Um, but, but it's possible that his oxygenation is still not happening. So without this machine, he would still have those low stats and or not be essentially alive yeah, exactly. right in this moment. So the movements that they're doing, I think you saw it just now as, again, stimulating the back as uh, the gentleman on the right of the frame is doing now. It, it's, they're just making sure that the breathing muscles are being used, or that he starts using them properly, because again, he's been uh, intubated mm -hmm. for a few days now. These are muscles we use all day, every day, without failure. So this is something that can be quite uh, debilitating for someone who's been healthy up until now, suddenly not even being able to breathe properly on your own and that's without without talking about your lung it's the muscles that help you breathe you know are just too weak mm -hmm. so this will be done about two times a day um, for more days and because you can't just start standing um, you would think that oh well mobilizing the patient means getting him moving yeah. getting him up he's walking down the hallway no it starts like Tasman just said mm -hmm. with the lungs. Yeah. This is a very important step. And um, for the patient, it's not necessarily the most comfortable, but it is definitely mm -hmm. the most necessary. Definitely. And um, just mentioning again the, the psychological effects. This is a young man, 30-year-old man. He's never been seriously ill before. He He's kind of uh, decompensated within a few days to being, you know, someone who can't even breathe properly on his own anymore. This is this is why it's so important uh, to have the physiotherapist talk to this patient, set goals, acknowledge uh, every little tiny thing that, you know. Each step is a positive yeah, exactly. step is, is what we're trying to say. Um, and there's not really... Uh, um, I guess when it comes to COVID-19, she's mentioning there's not really a specific person that ends up with a more severe case or a less severe case. It could really um, affect anyone. So a day on intensive station, when they are sick, can be very long. So she's saying again, the days, we, the days are long. They're very long if you're, an if you're a patient on intensive care. It, yeah. terrible, you know, you need psychological assistance because it, it's just, it hits you like a train. Right. So, um, 
Again, we started out with the lungs and we're just going to kind of fast forward in his therapy. Um, this would be the next step after mm -hmm. we've um, started using the lungs again. We're stabilizing the feet, we're stabilizing the arms, we're stabilizing the hips, making him stand. And then eventually it would go to walking and possibly then um, out of the intensive period, which is what our goal is. So something else that was mentioned just now is that the relationship that the patient, and as Lena said just now as well, uh, they have a very, very close relationship with the physiotherapists, with the nurses, you know, the doctors, the doctors as well, but, you know, the doctors aren't there yeah. for eight hours. I think it's important to notice how many people it yeah. takes to actually take care of mm. each patient. Um, if you remember back at the beginning, we had four nurses and anesthesiologists and possibly another doctor um, waiting. And here we also have, again, the nurses and and two physiotherapists and the technician, of course. So um, Mr. Streich here is telling us that we've finished our physical therapy um, and eventually we're going to be taking him off the ECMO machine. Uh, but first we're going to jump back up to the studio mm -hmm. to have a look at his blood. Exactly. Yeah. So oh, we're going to start with his uh, CT. This is his new uh, thorax CT. As you can see, it's changed completely. Mm -hmm. If you remember back to the first one, you had this um, uh, white uh, discoloring on the bottom mm -hmm. and only a small bit of the dark coloring on the upper uh, right-hand corner of the CT. So it's just saying again, this is a realistic uh, CT. We can see uh, some bullet, which are areas where there's just air, you know, there could be an emphysema there. This could be something that, you know, he, the patient will be stuck with with the rest of his life. But on the other hand, the uh, progress that has been made is amazing. You know, we can still see a little bit of the, this, these uh, ground glass opacities. Um, and that even though this patient is COVID negative at this point, this is damage that's been done to the lung that needs time to heal. And again, if, if it's an uh, emphysema, it, it's something that won't, won't heal. Yeah. So uh, now let's have a look at his blood work again now nearing the end of therapy before we take him off the ECMO. So we can see the blood uh, oxygen level is much better. We're at 97%. The, the pressure of the oxygen, 84, we can tolerate that. And uh, that's great. So now let's go back to the patient. Um, with these kind of blood panels, it's a very good indication that the patient is able to come off of the ECMO machine. So here we can see the team getting ready to um, take out the tubes and we're going to see how the exchange um, between the anesthesiologist, uh, the nursing staff and our technician goes in this process. So they're saying that his uh, breathing has, has become better and better over the last few days. He's mobile, he's happy. And now what they're going to do is a, uh, what they call in German a gas auslast test. They're going to turn off the oxygen on the ECMO and see if the patient's breathing is able to support his oxygen needs, basically. And if it works well, they can leave it off for a, a couple of hours and see if he stays stable. And if, if he does stay stable, well, that means he doesn't mean need the uh, ECMO anymore. Right, and if you can remember back to um, the middle of this program where our technician was showing us the different parts of the machine, this is where they're going to be using that silver knob to turn down the oxygen. <coughs> so he's saying there's 800 milliliters of blood that are outside of the patient's body at the moment. It's quite a bit. That's, that's, and that's uh, three uh, transfusions, I believe, he said. So what they're going to do is they're going to introduce uh, uh, basically this natsel back into the into the game and wash out the blood back into the patient's body. Right, so you'll still have this flow going even though the oxygen isn't being added in by the machine. So the pump is still functioning during this weaning phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 800, okay. We've turned off the oxygen. Um, das sind schon also zwei bis drei 
Normale and now they're going to stop. Uh, they're going to clamp the tubing that's taking blood out of the body and leave the tube going that's basically pumping blood back into the body. So it's quite simple, they just clamp it. Steropholin lösung sozusagen austauschen. And they, sorry, it's not naturally introduced, it's uh, electrolyte. Electrolyte. And they're going to re uh, transfuse <laughs> the blood in that tube. Good, we have the gas flow. We can see the color of the tubing change. From red to red. And as you can see on the schläuchen noch sieht, there is the angesprochene blood, which noch in the schläuchen is, and genau dieses wollen wir jetzt retransfundieren. And again, there's a lot of communication going on between the different members of the team. Yeah. So once the technician can see that there is a clear liquid flowing through the tubes, he can um, note to the uh, anesthesiologist that he can clamp off the tubing, just like we saw in the um, introduction of the tubing. And Essentially, they're going to cut between these two clamps. And it's important to point out at this point that this, we're still in the process of, of putting blood back into the body. So what we're doing is we're getting ready to take out the, the venous line, yes. so the tube in the groin. Sagt dann jetzt eben dem Anästhesisten, danke Philipp. Sagt dann jetzt eben dem Anästhesisten Bescheid. Er kann dann jetzt auch schon anfangen, an der Vene äh, die Explantation vorzubereiten. Und ich mache dann jetzt genau dasselbe weiter. Okay, so they're just pointing out again, they've really, they've done a lot of clamping, there's a whole system in place that if anything goes wrong now, nothing, nothing can, nothing terrible can happen. To the patient, to the patient, exactly. So he's getting ready just to cut between those two uh, clamps. And then you can get rid of that part of the And he's mentioning that it, there is the um, danger that it might Spray a little, so they always recommend covering it when making the cut. So the ECMO therapy is officially um, ended with this cut, and um, they're going to do the same thing with the central line. Mm -hmm. And again, they're communicating, is it all right if I continue? The technician has uh, given him the thumbs up, and they're going to cut through. And there we go. Now there's no way you can reattach the ECMO. Mm -hmm. so we can see the patient is, is stable. And what they're also mentioning is that, again, because this is a simulation, we wouldn't, uh, we aren't going to show what procedures go into it next, but this involves removing the cannula and closing up the two incisions um, on the neck and on the groin, which involves a lot of pressure, mm -hmm. uh, For a long to amount of time. 10 yeah. to 30 minutes of, of intense pressure on both areas until there's an adequate clotting factor there. Looks like we have another. So the question uh, from the chat was, yeah. do you need to do a CT once you've attached the ECMO? And the answer is basically no. I mean, you can, you have the option of doing it, mm -hmm. but it's you don't particularly need one. Clinically speaking, the patient is doing super well. There is no, there's no need for that. We can still continue taking x-rays of the lung. And if something terrible were to happen, of course, you can talk about embolisms, you can still run that CT, but not in routine, because you just don't need that. I mean, you can see from his O2 stats, from his blood pressure, from his um, breathing rate, from his heart rate, um, and also his um, pulse, how the ECMO machine is influencing him in a positive way. And if you are also checking, you know, the oxygen, if you're changing Turning it at the gas, all, yeah. you can see if there's any changes. So that's one of those things where clinically you um, are doing extra work by doing a CT at that point. Yeah. And of course CT is... Uh, a type of x-ray as well, which, which the body doesn't like getting too many x-rays mm -hmm. at once. And in this case, it would just be unnecessary. He is, he is just mentioning 
Again, the longer the patient is on ECMO, the higher the probability of complication. But this is true for intubation for a lot of uh, medical procedures anyway. Because a lot of people uh, wonder why not just put them on the ECMO and keep them on the ECMO. Yeah. And that's because, again, you want the patient to be able to um, heal on their own, breathe on their own, and get them uh, the oxygenated blood on their own the way the lung function is supposed to be. So we're going to get into some numbers now, talking about COVID patients in the intensive care unit in Tübingen uh, during the first wave. So uh, overall, we had 86 patients here with a ratio of 21 to 55, female to male. 28 of those patients died, which gives us a mortality rate of 32%. The maximum patients we had per day were 33, and the average age was 67.7 years. But the uh, ages ranged from 29 to 92. Uh, 18 patients received an ECMO therapy, so what we just saw, and 43 received some type of dialysis. The average uh, stay in the ICU is 18.3 days. Um, and the average time uh, where they needed uh, some kind of respiration and breathing assistance was about 15.7 days. And those that needed more than 95 hours um, were 63 of those 86 patients. And again, we want to point out that this was during the first wave. So if you look at the calendar on the right-hand side, um, from the 15th of March, it looks like, until the 20th, of May. Exactly. And I'm sure there will be similar um, data or corresponding data from wherever you are in the world. You're welcome to just look up the numbers that your healthcare agency is can provide. Exactly. Right? And a lot of that is also available on the WHO. This is readily available for anyone. We have our information, obviously, from the um, university clinic, but you can also look at the Robert Koch Institute to get more information on what's uh, happening in Germany currently, as well as in that first wave, as far as statistics for um, the population as a whole. But this is for us here in the um, university clinic of Tübingen. Und die Patienten waren so im Durchschnitt 18 Tage auf Intensivstation und hatten 16 Tage beatmet im Schnitt. Yeah. So um, she's mentioning again, if you look at the curve here on this chart, it was quite steep and at one point there were just very, very many patients at one time. So there's a question going on in the studio there asking about the feeling from someone who works you know, full term in an ICU when he goes out and he sees people not socially distancing, not wearing a mask, not believing in corona uh, as a serious illness. And he's saying it's, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. It's difficult for him to see because he was there when there were too many patients, you know, and he only has a certain number of beds, intensive care beds. That's something that's quite a political uh, point here in Germany at the moment because every, a lot of people are saying, well, we have the beds. And he's saying, well, we have the beds, but we don't necessarily have enough staff. And we saw how many people are involved you know, just treating one patient. So that's four to six people per patient. And it's just difficult. Quite. And it's very difficult when you have people putting themselves um, in a situation where they are possibly being exposed to COVID when other people are out freely, mm -hmm. um, let's say, enjoying themselves and um, putting then the hospital workers in a very stressful and possibly dangerous situation. Another thing that he's talking about is, uh, you know, your rights. He's saying, yes, it is. It's, it's, it's very difficult because you are having to kind of set yourself back and say, OK, you know, I I'm going to go without. But he says to remember, you know, other people, you know, they, they will benefit. You might not see it. You might not. You might never know how many people you've helped. Uh, but by simply wearing a mask or saying, well, you know, sit at distance from each other at the table, you know, that these are things that may save lives. And it, and it, 
And it's difficult because you can't see that happening. It, it feels very trivial, putting on a mask or, you know, avoiding people in the street if it's busy. And we can so schwer verläufe of jeden Fall verhindern. We can now the Zahlen aus America. So, Frau Hebele, uh, Dr. Hebele is, mining, uh, is thinking that it's, you know, easy to criticize the, um, the government, it's easy to criticize the universities, it's easy to criticize the clinics. Yeah. Um, but it's one of those things where so many people are involved, not just the patient, but, you know, the entire medical staff. Um, and the, not just the patient either, but his his friends and family are involved exactly. and are put at risk as well. And uh, the most important thing is that we need to work together in order to overcome this uh, yeah. pandemic and overcome the um, possible um, overflow in intensive care units. How can you do that? By minimizing the amount of patients that you have. How can you do that? By putting on the masks, by staying 1.5 meters away from each other, by adhering to the rules and regulations as they change. And one of the things she mentioned is that uh, uh, it is, it is the, the, the most important thing. And it's something that we want to tell you guys as well. Just, just look out for each other. Socially distanced. And um, thank be you. Be responsible. Yes, and thank you uh, to all of our experts that came in today. Thank you to our um, doctors and cardio technicians and nurses down in the uh, seminar room. Mm -hmm. And from the Institute of Clinical Anatomy and Cell Analysis. Wir schalten auf die grüne Kamera, würde ich vorschlagen, weil dann kann man uns alle drei nebeneinander sehen. Ich äh, möchte mich ganz, ganz herzlich bedanken. Dazu, was Sie jetzt äh, gesagt haben, kann man gar nichts mehr hinzufügen. Ich möchte ähm, mich bedanken ich bei dem gesamten Team, das unten war, bei den Pflegekräften, den, den äh, Kardiotechnikern, den Ärzten, selbstverständlich auch bei dem Team der äh, klinischen Anatomie. Und Zellanalytik, unserem Institut, die hier die Filme. We would like to thank you guys for listening in today in this very special Sexio Chirurgica. And um, hopefully we'll have other times for us to do this for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you at the next episode. <laughs>